lightning and thunder right okay. by us. Yeah, that, that is one thing. You know, I live in a valley here, so you get the, the rolling thunder effect sometimes, or the thunderstorms like 50 miles away, but it just kind of like blah, 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 goes on through the valley, but that's kind of fun. <laughs> I love it. I mean, that it, it puts me to sleep. It's like a nice, such a nice, I don't know, because I've got like a roof and four walls, right? Like, <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, the, the dumbest thoughts, but it was like, man, just the difference of not having a roof right now would just put me right back into caveman times, essentially, like all the technology in my house and like all the cool creature comforts you just take my roof away during like a really bad storm and it's like everything i own is for nothing <laughs> yeah like i do all that commuting uh so you know rain i like snow's not running just brush it off it's gone but uh yeah rain can get if it's raining sideways you're in for a bad day so <laughs> and rain can hurt you i mean it's 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 one thing to be wet but if if you just like sit around in like wet socks and wet shoes for a few hours like you can legitimately cause yourself some major problems <laughs> right yeah now it's like you know you take a shower you leave the house five minutes later you're like i need a shower <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not cool <laughs> um let me see i'm gonna bring up my notes over here i hit the record it's good already your notes didn't seem that extreme i had i had some similar ones they they weren't that i was being um you know hyperbolic a bit there <laughs> i've got some interesting notes on this one too that, that i wasn't aware of before I, I started looking deeper into it yeah yeah i mean obviously there's something here so i, I guess let's see where it rolls so <laughs> i'll do a little intro hello welcome to our caught disney series on oral hygiene this is matt here coming back as a paranoid american thomas gorenz hello hello um yeah today's today's film's bambi and i i have to admit of the ones we've done so far uh, and, and the next few disney's that would be on on the line this is probably the one i was most like meh about revisiting <laughs> i'm glad you said it <laughs> maybe maybe because i don't know i like a little psychedelia in my um in my animation and this one doesn't really have that it does have some interesting stuff watching it last night i definitely like you know now that we're like looking for big overarching themes and stuff, you know, they're there. So that's certainly not lacking, but. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that uh, like overwhelmingly the, the general reviews for this one within the spectrum of Disney movies, this one tends to be in like the boring end of the spectrum. Uh, even like, even when it came out, I was looking in, um, for movie reviews from like 1940s, right, right as this came out. And a lot of them were kind of, making the exact same complaints that, you know, modern critics are watching it going back. And, you know, people that said, when I grew up watching Bambi, uh, you know, I remember it being this, this uh, really deep tale and they would go back and watch it now. And like, yeah, it's actually a little bit shallow and boring. <laughs> well, it's definitely kind of, well, it's, I, I would say elemental in many ways, um, di different than the dwarf elemental. I'm thinking more of, you know, the, yeah. the <laughs> not, not, not the, not, you know, like earth, wind, fire sort of elemental um, <laughs> is what I'm, I'm suggesting. Um, I think this is probably just my own faulty, faulty memory, faulty memory and not the Mandela effect. But hey, maybe it could be if people are out there and are like, hey, I remember that too. I seem to remember this movie being put on hold because of World War II and coming out in the late 40s. So when I was looking, it's actually like 1942, like right smack in the middle of the war. So I was like, actually, a little surprised uh, I, I guess it's after bambi they couldn't make another feature film for a long time because of the war yeah which is funny because the book bambi was written smack dab in the middle of world war one <laughs> so that's right <laughs> both the both the book and the movie were essentially products of of wartime yeah yeah although i in the book and well the book was banned in the 30s in germany uh i guess for having a pacifist streak or something and, and of course the movie didn't show in germany in 1942 so <laughs> That wasn't going to happen. Um, could you? They were you, drinking Fanta, though. <laughs> did they? They have pineapple. So I discovered on my first trip to Europe, or no, second trip to Europe, actually. Then, you know, if if, if uh, for anyone not aware, um, but essentially when the U.S. had to stop trading with Germany, you know, Nazi Germany for World War II, Coca-Cola set up the entire Fanta business and brand specifically so they could continue selling their soda to nazis sort of like circumventing the uh the trading with the enemy act it's like that weird fake mcdonald's they have in russia now 
Yeah. Well, it started <laughs> as a real McDonald's, right? And then they were just like, this is ours now. And then they just kind of like, I don't know, like flipped flipped the M or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turned yeah. it over and put a little uh, stick next to it, made it an R. <laughs> well, now I'm sitting here wondering, though, because they, obviously they wouldn't, the McDonald's Corporation wouldn't be like, yeah, we just changed our name in Russia right now. But maybe I wonder if they're pulling the same trick. <laughs> I mean, it's not outside the, the realm, right? <laughs> Makes that would actually be sense. one of the most tame things that would have happened over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not here like, oh, my God, I can't believe they do that. I'm like, yeah, it makes sense that they do that. <laughs> um, can you give us that, that TV guide rundown for, for Bambi? Oh, well, so Bambi, the, the book and the movie is about a doe or a, a fawn growing up under the care of a nameless doe, essentially. And uh, mom gets shot. The baby kind of gets raised by a bunch of rabbits and ragtag. And then there's just like a fast forward to now it's an adult. And it sort of repeats the, the very similar cycle where it has a uh, um, sort of like a child and then abandons said child and just kind of goes and hangs out with the rest of the bucks and then leaves the, the doe and her fawn by themselves. It's, it's a very cyclical nature sort of story. And it's, and it's very much down to earth. There's, very little magic and sort of wonder outside of the talking animals. Right. Although uh, we can, you know, I, I was thinking of kind of natural magic, you know, a animism, is it? Or, uh, you know, some of the Wiccans stuff might get, I'm not that familiar with that, but I imagine they'd find something. Yeah, fair enough. Like I mean, uh, essentially any nature magic, you could say, because the entire movie takes place 100% in nature. There's no indoor scenes whatsoever. And I'm pretty sure that all of the animators that worked on it were basically like working in the zoo as they were working on this stuff. Uh, so they were everything uh, completely in this movie was based on making it look as close to nature as possible. Yeah. They were bringing deer into the, you know, I, I guess they're in, yeah, they're in the Burbank studio by this point. So um, which was quite large. And, and I recently learned that when they, uh, built this Burbank Disney studio, this whole complex, it was built to double as a hospital. So if Disney's com if the Disney company failed, they just convert it to a hospital. But that gave them like and, uh, a lot. What was Disney going to run the hospital or was going to go to like whoever was next in line to take over the, the rent? No, Disney was going to go out of business. <laughs> so it was just, you know, because when he, when they built it, Snow White had come out. So that was a big windfall. But the company at that point was like no sure thing. Uh, Fleischer was was busy biting it about that point, so it was perfectly reasonable that that the Disney company could go out of business, and they uh, just made sure. I think that was like the city's like request, like have this be multi purpose just in case. It's interesting to consider what would an America would be without a Disney. Like if yeah, Disney yeah. had just flash in the pan you know someone someone dropped the the film reel into like a puddle or something i don't know uh and then it, you know snow white just never happened you know i wonder wonder what today would look like what there's our media the, consumption would be there's the story of um jimmy hendrix leaving the original mix of access bold and love in the back of a taxi cab <laughs> <laughs> so they had to remix the whole thing like really quickly <laughs> that oh, i believe that one i actually believe quite a bit I've never well, heard that before, but it, it sounds instantly believable to me. Well, the, the other one, um, you know, I like to play along with with music and Hendrix. You usually you got to down tune your Stratocaster a little bit because he had his down a step or so. But um, Purple Haze, actually, it's fine because he played on a Telecaster, which he didn't retune. But the reason is he forgot to bring his guitar to the recording uh, session. <laughs> it's just like, hey, man, I forgot my guitar today. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's weird, like these iconic things, like the bizarre behind the scenes. So, but yeah, the Bambi animator just got the, the, the bad end of the stick because, you know, some people got like nude models and, and they got deer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to go hang out at the zoo. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I guess I would say, especially the deer motion, like the, the way that they're walking, it definitely, yeah, you can see it like very easily on screen. Like that's, an insane amount of work to make that happen. And, and I wonder, I mean, obviously anyone that sat and probably like seen deer and watched them was even more impressed, but I wonder like for the target audience, how much of that really hand detailed animation was a hundred percent necessary, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, these are the first like 
technically these really are the first like cartoon animals on screen of course they've had all the yeah. anamorphic thing but um like one of the the guys that's sometimes on his podcast luke said to me um yesterday because he's he's just gotten he's a gamer he just got into King, kingdom heart so now he has to like actually know disney he's like well pluto just looks like a guy in a dog suit on all fours <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's weird how like there's some dogs that can talk and some that are pets and others that have their own pet dogs. Like doesn't Goofy have a pet dog and and uh like some of the comic books, I think. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but yeah, the the point being that before this it was all like, you know, like literally like Mickey Mouse stuff. I, I guess Gertie the dinosaur you could say was sort of well, even that not really, but this this was the first time to really throw in some lifelike. When this is and this one is the most widely cited for being like um, sort of a, a preview of nature for any any little kids first image of nature and animals, even almost to this day, uh, is still kind of like this movie Bambi, if it's not the actual outdoors where you're seeing deer. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's how it would have played for me in a, you know, preschool summertime matinee where they just drag all the, the tots off to a theater, you know, go in there and shut up for a while or don't shut up. We don't care. You're in the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> just, just leave me alone actually yeah um i just i just had the, the finally had the experience because my daughter's 13 she wanted to go see an anime at the theater but she was too embarrassed to let her parents in so we just had to sit around the lobby fortunately it was six to eight <laughs> minutes but i was like well, i'll go see thor can you just sit at opposite ends and just pretend you were strangers for an <laughs> hour yeah no nah, um i was like i'll go see thor then but it's like no no the anime is only like 68 minutes so that that doesn't so we didn't have to wait in the lobby that long but <laughs> but that that was um my first experience with that so <laughs> um, we'll get ready for more i'm sure that was just the first of many now <laughs> yeah yeah really <laughs> and, um, and i was i, I was going to mention too that uh in addition to this being a lot of kids first foyer into sort of what the outdoors might be like if animals could talk but there's also this Bambi effect. And I think that's because it was also one of these first widely known anthropomorphic cartoons um, that put like a face on animals. And the the Bambi effect is essentially where people want to save any kind of cute looking animals, in particular deer, because of the, the result of this movie um, had people wanting to like, you know, stop uh, hunters from hunting deer all of a sudden, even, you know, back when it came out in the 40s, there was, you know, all sorts of movements to you know end hunting of deers uh specifically because of how cute they made bambi and a lot of a new wave of like uh veganism and vegetarianism um sort of came through and again it was cited as you know this bambi syndrome or this bambi effect where if, if you you know if you've got like a cute looking animal like no one really cared so much about like wild hogs or <laughs> you know like um you know like chickens i guess because they didn't have the same cuteness factor as a little fawn and the doe and you know exactly what disney sort of um sort of emphasized in the entire movie and animation yeah well you, you gotta wait till moana till they go chicken i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> although even that, then it's hard to make a, a chicken look really cute yeah i mean you know i try if i see a spider on the street i try not to curb stomp it you know but uh well i feel really like that's no just reason. like a normal thing for like anyone over the age of eight to not be an absolute uh <laughs> you know serial killer deep down or, or you know so sociopath if, if you're like searching out um animals to just kill in your normal day uh i don't know but 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 i mean that it's ironic bringing that up in this topic because um, I think we'll get later on into the very realistic need to cull a species, uh, you know, specifically deer, like they need to be cold in many ways because they don't have a lot of other natural predators, although spiders, unless your city is being overrun by spiders, um, I feel like it would be a little bit uh, mean, I'll just call it mean, to <laughs> just go and stomp them out. My, my big moral conundrum is that about this time of year, I saw them last night, but it wasn't raining. But if it is raining and I'm walking on, on the streets along these rice fields, just like hundreds of tiny frogs hopping around. I'm trying my best not to step on any of them, but I'm pretty sure I'm stepping on a few. <laughs> we've, we've got a huge problem here in South Florida, especially with these cane toads. Um, or I don't know if it's the cane toad or there's another type of toad that they have here that is poisonous to dogs. And it's poisonous to you know cats and sort of like animals and they're they're kind of they're not supposed to be here the huge invasive species 
So they're actually suggested to, you know, kill him as you see him. And the way that the state recommends you kill him is uh, you find him and you just put him in a free, you grab him, put him in a bag and put him in a freezer or something. And you just let them kind of like slowly freeze to death. That's supposed to be like the most humane, but these things are like the size of a Big Mac, you know, they're like, <laughs> they're huge. And uh, I mean, people just legit, you know, hunt them straight up, hunt them. And they like, you know, uh, a really strong pellet gun won't even penetrate the the hard sort of like skeleton back that they've got there so there's it's again again it's like um a moral conundrum because it's like you walk across it and you see it and you and you know a it's an invasive species if a dog or a cat comes across this thing just by sniffing it or licking it it could just essentially die from it um and you know there's like it's not doing anything good in whatever environment you find it in essentially so what do you do do you just uh, just kind of like pretend you didn't see it. Do you do you thwack it? Do you uh, put it in your freezer? I would never put a frog in my freezer, but whatever. If I did in a steel cage. No, I thought you were going to say the suggestion was to kill it with fire. So, <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, uh, you can't just really trust a lot of Florida people with open flames. So I'm sure they would suggest that if it were anywhere but Florida. Um, as far as invasive species, uh, coming from Atlanta, you know, in Georgia, we have the insane amounts of kudzu growing everywhere. I don't know if it makes it that far south or not, but oh yeah, no, we've got I've got some in my backyard actually. Yeah, so um, of course in Japan, it you know it doesn't do that. It just it's here and there and not everywhere. So <laughs> it loves the climate here and it doesn't have again it doesn't have any real like natural um, anything that can take over what it can take over. Like it's it's the strongest. For the past six years or so, I've I've really taken a a um made it my hobby basically to do a lot of walking, like unnecessary walking in my commute, and uh, but I have you know like I can see the cycles of nature a lot more. I got stars in certain places at certain times of year. I don't know the stars that well, but I can be like, oh yeah, it's 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 fall because that one's like staring me in the face right now. Um, I don't know if rice fields count as nature, but you can definitely watch the cycles over the year go on in there uh because of like when they're flooded when they're dry when there's nothing there when there's something there so you know i can definitely appreciate that sort of thing and and yeah, i mean it's, it's nature the same as like a cornfield is nature right exactly yeah yeah but yeah just um i, I guess some orange groves hell orange groves here is are all over, over the place oh yeah yeah i'm yeah, i'm in the valley of you know mountain range in japan so i got rice fields right <laughs> but yeah just in the past six years i'd say in particular because when, when i was a kid i was a boy scout i went camping but i guess you're always in different places and you don't you know walking through the same area i think is kind of important to pick up on those cycles if you're in lots of different places you won't notice so i said we could go on a whole tangent on the boy scouts at some point <laughs> oh yeah yeah sure <laughs> um but first, what I wanted to do on this film is kind of like, um, I don't want to, I don't want to be like overwhelmingly negative. So I just want to throw out the couple things I don't like about this film, and I'm I'm curious where you stand on these. Okay, issues. you're gonna you're gonna front load the negativity. That's right, I'm front loading because then I want to okay. basically drop it. So unless we, okay. you know, find okay. something else. But um, the voices are annoying. <laughs> I kept saying Dumbo doesn't talk. I love that. One of the reasons is because Bambi's. All the, all the, I, I find the, the child animals pretty annoying. <laughs> and I think a large part of that, if, if you rewatch it with this in mind, the, the voices are not acting. It's just people talking. It's kids talking and it's adults talking and trying to say very normal, down to earth things that a normal parent or a normal kid would kind of say. Um, they add a little bit of cutesy to it. You know, the thumper's missing a tooth. So there's like a little bit of a lisp there. Um, but the things that they're saying and the way that they're saying them are not cartoony in any way, especially if you compare that to sort of like the overdramatic acting that you've got in the previous films and a lot of the ones that came after this one. Uh, and I think that's a large part of it. The reason why it's so annoying is you're just hearing, you know, kids talk and people talk. So I had this weird thought and actually I could make it happen here. Um, like Miyazaki films, you know, Totoro, Totoro, amazing film. Right. What? they they actually did get like name talent to do the english dub and it just becomes horrible in the english dub like because there's a way that you know kids talk in japan there's a way that you know people talk you know certain tones and it just it all gets blown out the window so totoro becomes like a bad movie in english so <laughs> 
I was like, I think Bambi would work better in Japanese. <laughs> you might not be wrong, or at least in like German or something, in like a like a Austro-Hungarian or something closer to its native language, maybe. And yeah, yeah, maybe English does ruin sort of like non-action rom-coms, right? If it's not an action rom-com or a superhero movie, then maybe English is is dumbing it down a little bit. Yeah, because Totoro has the two girls and and the boy who lives nearby and. In Japanese, there's certain tones that all Japanese know because that's how kids talk in Japan. It sounds completely natural, right? So, um, well, especially in, in the hardcore anime crowd, I think once you get beyond like um, just the introduction and watching Akira and Death Note or whatever's been, you know, like easily sort of spread out, but once you watch all of the normal stuff and you want to like start watching more and more anime, there's it almost seems like there's a threshold where people start saying like oh yeah i don't watch you know i don't watch dubs like i i have to watch it with subtitles or i have to, like i know enough people that are it's so in love with anime that they're starting to try to just learn japanese so they can watch anime without the subtitles <laughs> <laughs> i'm nowhere near that but uh <laughs> whatever um oh what was it we got the miyazaki oh one i i recently recently for another podcast watched uh summer wars i don't know if you're familiar with that one you have to remind me Okay, um, it's 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 kind of like it was made by the guy that did one of the original Digimon movies and has kind of that vibe of, uh, you know, cyber creatures and fighting in the cyber world. But most of the action takes place in the Japanese house during the summer holiday. So that one, of course, should be in Japanese. But when I was watching it, my um, my video would just default to English. And a few times I forgot to switch it. And actually, that one wasn't bad in English. It was weird. It's just, yeah, I guess it's, you know, there's a special sauce to voice acting. And anyway, Bambi did not hit that special sauce for me. So, <laughs> and, and that, again, was one of the many complaints that even reviews that came out at the time all sort of called it out for that exact same thing, that the, the voices were just straight up annoying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Issue number two is I watched this less than 12 hours ago. And though one of the songs is Oscar nominated, I can't hum any of them right now. All I can think of is like spring, spring, springy, spring, 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 which I know that's wrong. <laughs> you know, like the songs don't to me don't seem that memorable in this one. Uh, <clears throat> after three movies where like the songs are super memorable. So I've got a quote that I want to read just just a single line. For, and this is from the New Republic's 1942 review uh, by Manny Farber. And they called it uh, Saccharin Symphony. And one of the scathing lines that I thought, it says, and there's songs everywhere coming out of the mountains, coming from under the trees, flooding you from the most maudlin sounds a director ever let happen. Example, drip, drip, drop, little April shower. And that's just, the, that's the, all they say about the entire soundtrack. Um, and it's titled the, you know, the Saccharin Symphony. So I just thought that was, you know, for someone in 1942 to have seen this come out, um, it wasn't like, you know, they were looking through all of like the flash and, and they mentioned a couple other things too about how, you know, you can't distract um, with all these great visuals and this highly, you know, animated animals that like, the the dialogue and the music is just not up to snuff yeah so although i would say that the music coming out of the mountains i guess that's the score uh that that's not, that's fine <laughs> well and and honestly anytime that there was like a strong wind or rain or snow coming on i loved how they did the vocalization that sort of like reflected you know they would get stronger as the wind would blow a little bit harder in the animation and um that was like a much better way of synchronizing the the music to what was actually happening on screen way better than the drip 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 drop thing of the april shell like you could see because every time like water would um form on a leaf and it would drop to another leaf they would try to kind of like time it and say drip drip drop and all this it just the animation didn't necessarily line up the music didn't it wasn't you know amazing like you said it's it's not an earwig it's just something that's like okay yeah that's kind of a generic little thing to be in there but yeah, there's a just, reason why people aren't still singing drip, 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 <laughs> drop today, right? Yeah, really. But just, just I'm trying to contrast that the score is fine. I, or as I wrote in my notes, they're really Mickey Mousing the score in this one. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a, a time and place. And this is both, I suppose. Um, what was the other? I had, I had one other thing that, that was in, in my craw on this one. What was it? Well, how about, how about you while we're, while we're having the negativity, negativity corner? <laughs> uh, I don't really I don't know if I have any other negatives at all the, the I have one note 
I have one note in here because I guess I don't I don't remember this one as much. I know I watched it a few times as a kid, but I never watched it after, you know, I, I grew out of being a child. I don't think I ever had a reason to put Bambi on or pay attention to it if it was on. So going back into it, I had some preconceived, maybe like false memories or false expectations. But my no, my note was, it's 40 minutes in, uh, die already. Like <laughs> I was waiting for this because I guess I remembered that the mother died a little bit earlier into the movie. And then it was all about, you know, Bambi dealing with it. Cause I guess that's the, the theme of like Lion King and um, the land before time and almost every other sort of movie where cartoon and, you know, parents die. But in this one, it actually happens like way beyond the halfway mark. It's like an hour, about an hour long movie. And it happens somewhere around 45 minutes in. So three quarters of the way in the mom dies and then all of a sudden it like skips forward a year and then Bambi's hanging out with the dad and all of the birds are singing like, oh, you know, don't dwell on the past and just be happy. And it's like, wait a minute, we just saw someone die here. So I don't know. I, I think the pacing overall was was one of the downsides. I think that's what maybe makes people call this one boring because it takes so long to kind of get to any sort of action. And then as soon as it does happen, it's like someone in the back was like, all right, guys, wrap it up. You know, you've got you got 10 minutes to wrap this movie up. Get it over. <laughs> um, so that, I guess those are my my negative, if you could call them negatives. But that's just I don't know. It's it's clearly a movie that uh, that has stood the test of time. And I, and I constantly make this one. And I don't know how much longer I can say this about these movies. Um, but this is a movie that legitimately like my grandpa probably saw maybe not as a kid, but, you know, in his 20s or something. And my my dad definitely saw as a kid. My mom definitely saw as a kid. Um, I don't know how many more movies going forward I can say that with, but I feel like that's such a crazy thing to imagine that, you know, my grandpa probably watched this movie when it came out and my dad watched this movie, maybe not when it came out, but when it was still fairly fresh. Yeah, maybe maybe shoved into that uh, kitty matinee. <laughs> um, I guess this is this is the birth of the formula though maybe that's why the pacing is so weird this this is the you know one of your parents dies uh basis because with snow white we don't really i mean we have, obviously mom's not in the picture but they don't really talk about it much uh pinocchio is a creation so that and his you know if geppetto's his dad dad's around the whole time gumbo gets separated from mom but doesn't lose mom where where you know this is the start of the um the dead parent disney trope <laughs> honestly uh the dumbo is so much sadder than anything that this movie i know we were talking last time about like a team and b team and stuff um but man dumbo just still takes the cake away uh but like if you were to put these two movies up it's sadder it's like more of a tragic um even though the mom doesn't actually die at the end of dumbo it just feels so much more tragic what she goes through versus the i mean i i understand the other one dies <laughs> but the way that it plays out it just feels more tragic i don't know it like you're way more attached to dumbo's mom than i think you are to bambi's mom or maybe that's just me maybe i just hate deer and i'm just coming to terms with that <laughs> but yeah this this was the a team right and the b team definitely showed them up in this case <laughs> for sure um what is a let's see we don't have the earworms we did that there's there's something else that um that I had on my mind, but oh yeah yeah, yeah deadbeat dad. I, I don't know if that's just an elk thing, but it's like yeah, I'm not gonna even like acknowledge your existence until like you're like <laughs> fully mature. <laughs> well, it, well, it's interesting too because uh, I mean this is jumping ahead a little bit, but you mentioned the the deadbeat dad elk, um or the buck rather, um and what's interesting is that if you look at how deer patterns actually work that buck essentially has command over all the female does in that area for, you know, like 300 acres or something. So essentially every doe that you see uh, in this movie, Bambi, they're all getting banged by that same buck. Like, okay. and, and even in the book, I believe that Bambi's sort of love interest in this, in this movie um, and in the book, it's actually his cousin. And in the, in the book, it's explicit that it's the cousin because all of the does in that area, you know, are banged by the exact same buck. So they're all kind of related to each other. <laughs> it's just steady pimping. Got it. Okay. There, it's like a Mormon, Mormon compound, you could say. <laughs> That's something that really hit me watching this last night. I'm like, 
I was starting to make like a few like ribald jokes. And I was like, wait, no, this movie is getting really horny all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and i had a note too that uh it caught me off guard that flower the skunk was actually a male <laughs> after the the year goes by and then you know the, there's a, a skunk with a really deep voice and i was expecting flower to be a girl but then they <laughs> show a girl skunk uh to which i don't know that one just caught me off guard yeah the uh thump thumpers um lady rabbit is especially kind of like weirdly disturbing for some reason i, I guess because well that might have been the, the origins of like uh not jessica rabbit the the space jam um lola bunny lola rabbit uh, you know bugs yeah, yeah. bunnies sort of counterpart right right and now we're i guess we're up to judy hops now because that there was lots of weird stuff on the internet there's some weirdly specific thing with judy hops on the internet that made no sense but uh i can't i can't <laughs> i did not say the it internet. In, yeah, yeah, really. I said it on a different podcast, but or, or no, someone someone else said it on a different podcast, but I cannot recall it at the moment. But yeah, you know, the internet takes you to weird places, doesn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, I just had to. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I wrote. Is this the incel version, the birds and the bees, and then the whole thing just like, no, we're actually gonna we're gonna go there in this in this 1942 children's animated thing. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just a cycle of life. No, minus, it is. <laughs> the movie version, at least, minus any animals doing anything wrong to each other. There's like one little fight where Bambi fights off like the, the new boyfriend of his cousin now that you find out. So it's essentially him fighting, you know, it's like a like a Hatfield McCoy kind of hillbilly situation where I'm fighting off my cousins for my cousin. <laughs> and and uh, but that's like the most violent I think it gets es essentially uh, aside from, you know, the hunter coming in. But that's actually another one of the big criticisms that um, people had about the movie and that was kind of removed entirely from the book because in the, the actual book, they do show just animals being mauled and, um, you know, being left for, for dead ascension. And I think there's one point where Bambi gets into a fight with another deer and it's just like, yeah, just leave me here to die. Like, this is horrible. I'm in excruciating pain. Um, and, and that was intentionally written in because the story of Bambi was supposed to be about how cruel nature can be and how man uh, how cruel man can be but there was also humans that took um that took some of the the fawn in and like nursed them and you know treated them right and then they went back into the herd and tried to tell bambi oh you know these humans were actually okay and then he ends up actually dying anyways <laughs> um <laughs> but but there was like it was a much deeper and more complicated story and then the movie just turned it into you know all animals are harmless um and again we're, we're talking about like bunnies and and deer here so they kind of are harmless you know what i mean but it just it leaves out like there's no deer ticks in this reality there's mm -hmm. no uh like when the bucks fight one of them just kind of like falls in a puddle and then scurries away and that's the end of it uh when in reality you know sometimes you know they they chase up all the other kids and all of the the other does or all the other fawns essentially just kind of like starve or have to then chase off the other ones so it lacks all of that extra depth which in turn again turn into this like vegan movement and anti-hunting movement even when this movie came out yeah no mange <laughs> there's no mange everything's like super cute again the bambi effect right yeah um oh i just have to throw in this note at some point uh that in Tokyo, I mean, I may or may not still be there. It was still there about five years ago. But uh, yeah, there's a, a restaurant, Bambi, and it's like Austrian themed. <laughs> so <laughs> I always thought that was like highly entertaining. But, and I had to look this up too. And uh, Walt Disney World, in fact, serves venison on property. So um, you can actually watch the movie Bambi on Disney property and then go and order deer and eat it in the same day <laughs> without leaving the park. Is it a Bambi themed restaurant? Is though it is not a Bambi themed restaurant. It's the Brown Derby. Um, uh, I think it's the only place in the park that serves venison. But I just I felt that was because I was just wondered like does does uh, Disney World serve deer anywhere? And yep, they sure enough do. I'm just scrolling down a bit. Um, oh, maybe maybe this is like where you're talking about the pacing. Yeah, it was like it's like this movie focuses. It's an early film focus on Campbell's hero's journey, but just mostly gets distracted, like literally in the bushes. Because <laughs> it, it definitely, I mean, like you said, the Lion King, like, like beats it out, not, not you know, paces it out much better, I should say. Well, big things happen in the Lion King. 
uh, like huge things. The biggest thing that happens in the first 40 minutes of Bambi is Bambi learns how to jump over a log. Bambi learns how to say the word bird. Um, Bambi observes the mom doing stuff. Bambi watches other animals doing stuff. Like there's not like these huge epic things that are happening. Again, this is one of the, you know, this, this is Walt Disney kind of like finding their footing and experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't. Cause no one else was doing this still at this time. Um, but it, it kind of missed the marks in some of those regards, especially if you compare it to after they nailed that formula of the lion King. Um, I think that, I mean, it's, it's almost like a night and day difference. Although you could almost argue too, that like the, the quality of the animation, it was almost like the animators, like no matter what you put in front of them, they were going to do just an outstanding job, no matter how mediocre the story was, you know, the animation, but the animation can't necessarily carry it the same way that a good story can carry mediocre animation. And I think that maybe, I don't know, maybe they found that out or, or someone must have considered that after this movie came out and got some of the reviews it got. Like, I, I know this actually originally was going to be the second uh, feature film they were going to do, and they, they just realized, oh, animating all these animals is going to be a bit of a task, and they, they put it off a few years. But um, and, and this was, and not to be, uh, you know, to clarify, this was an overwhelming commercial success. It, like, outsold, like, the movie outsold the next biggest blockbuster, which was, like, Casablanca or something. It outsold it, like, five times over in the same amount of time. So it... it um, for sure was a huge commercial success and a big popular release it was just sort of critically um, not as acclaimed when you compare it to all the other movies that Disney and even like the shorts a lot of it was uh, specifically about how down to earth and mundane and it was just following this normal cycle of you know natural birth and death uh, without injecting any kind of magic into it save for you know the the Wiccan <laughs> talking animals that were uh, doing incantations, but outside of that, I guess if I were going to be Captain Hindsight, what I would do is take this animation, you know, and put that to the Pastoral Symphony and Fantasia, and then none of the animals would be talking either, because you could tell the story and the length of that symphony uh, without too much trouble. Uh, yeah, honestly, this movie without voiceover would have elevated it in so many ways I, I mean it's it's easy to say in retrospect um but maybe that's actually worth uh, a shot you know just to to just you know rescore this movie take out all the talking and just put music behind it it might actually be a little bit easier to watch because yeah I, I i mean i wouldn't i don't think too many people would you know have a problem if you switch the greek thing in fantasia to something like this because you know like this thing um I guess that's the one in Fantasia that I'm it's still is like, why did they do that exactly? Because Pastoral Symphony, it's like that that is music that just straight up tells a story. It, it literally has a storm in it, you know, <laughs> in the music. So it seems like it would make sense to do. I mean, yeah, just interesting. In retrospect, I would have, hell, they should have made, you know, uh, Hercules back in 1942 and then put this in Fantasia. That, that would be my reinvention of reality. <laughs> Well, I mean, if, if you believe in multiple uh, realities, right, then there's infinite dimensions. And in one dimension, that has happened. So you can, re you can rest assured that somewhere someone's enjoying it. Right. OK, good. Yeah, I've had the idea. So it exists somewhere. <laughs> uh, I definitely the, something that does stick with me is and actually I, I could convolute it because um, when Bambi's mother dies, it's just like regular weather. Right. So the fire is much later. I had in my mind that there was, I guess that would be too much if there, you know, there's a fire and then there's hunters. I remember the same thing as you did though. I, I thought it like, you know, there was a fire and she gets shot and like it all happens at the same time, but no, it's, it's uh it's spread out in a, in a weird way too, in a way that, that feels like, uh, like the fire felt like a hat on top of a hat, you know? Yeah. But I really, I thought the fire animation was like super cool. Maybe that's why I, why both of us like thought it was like in the middle of the movie too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was thinking like they show up on that little Island or whatever. I'm like, you know, that's only like 10% of the animals surviving this inferno. <laughs> and they, sure. they don't really explain the fire as much, but we'll, I think we'll get into that. Cause I got some notes towards, towards the end of, of my list here, but that the number 
the the two main ways that humans sort of keep uh deer population in check is one by killing the doe because the doe is what produces um you know more deer so one of the main ways is you kill the doe instead of killing the bucks and the other one is just by um culling and burn you know doing controlled burns to just eliminate parts of their environment so whether whether this was intentional or not for the movie to focus on these two particular things is like the main climaxes when in reality they are the two main re- ways that we still to this day cull deer population i just thought, thought that was interesting well and, and that fires are you know necessary for forests i mean uh I, i've heard uh, again i'm i'm not like you know i'm not a forestry ranger what, what do we call the forest florist no all of those are wrong anyway that's not my bag but i've heard that uh the australian fires a few years ago one of the reasons they were so massive is because they had been doing like basically too much forest management for years right yeah they they decided that they didn't want to scare the animals away from all of these sort of overgrown brush areas where normally they would have continuously you know controlled them through burns they just didn't do it for long enough so the next time there was a regular burn it was you know so massive they couldn't get it under control so and that's kind of a similar thing that we're we're talking about here but um it's it's in particular it is used to cull populations of deer because the deer have pretty much no natural enemy whatsoever if you were to take away coyote attacks and sort of like wild dogs but wild dogs almost is like a side effect of of humans so if you took away humans it's really just coyotes like there's no other way and maybe ticks and just like you know disease and and uh sort of inbreeding but other than that deer would almost like you know take over the the planet it seems or they'd at least take over like the north the northern united states I think it's yes, yeah, Chuck Jones, isn't it? Who who did Wile E. Coyote? But anyway, the quote he had was like he went with the coyote because he's like coyotes always look like pitiful, even when they're like attacking. <laughs> so that was his thought for making for animating, you know, using Wile Coyote as like the heel for all these cartoons. <laughs> and and there's like, he wrote rules for the cartoons, which are actually quite fascinating, where the the road runner can never leave the road and never take any. Act, actual action against the coyote and, and that sort of thing the coyote always has to be the source of his own downfall <laughs> i love that it's, it's like defining physics right like physics in a system like all the formulas that you have to abide by it's wild there's like 10 rules he wrote that you know i guess they followed till the 90s when nobody cared anymore but <laughs> yeah, and, yeah until it was just like a, like a new dimension and, and all of a sudden all all of the characters can talk and they wear sneakers and they've got cell phones Oh, do you remember it was the mid '90s where they tried to make like the badass uh, Looney Tune characters? Yeah, and they and they all had like Air Jordans, <laughs> right? And they had, although there were a couple cool designs with like uh, Bugs Bunny would like have his ears down and like a backwards hat and had like a gold chain or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, someone was trying, but they've been given like an you know, an idiotic edict, more or less, right? <laughs> I I feel more than anything that someone probably was like. Uh, uh, violating you know copyrights and trademarks and just making sort of new renditions like hip ones and the companies were like we need to get ahead of this and they started to like embrace it and do it on their own just because they didn't want other one people infringing on it and and sort of like selling all the good stuff oh speak, speaking of infringing i i'm i'm going to just uh give the i don't remember who did the score but give them the credit it was just in the back of their head and it just came through but uh, near the end of the movie there's a little theme i think it's the uh post survival sur- inferno survival theme or whatever and it's almost the same as groucho marx as uh, these are the rules of my administration from duck soup so i thought that was kind of funny <laughs> i actually saw duck soup recently within within the last year yeah that's the, no one no one's allowed to smoke or tell a dirty joke and whistling is forbidden that uh that melody is very similar to what we get at the end of this so <laughs> it, it could use all the help that it could get you know what i mean <laughs> and and this was also um the first major disney movie at the, to this point i mean we're just counting what two before it um but that didn't necessarily come from some sort of a fairy tale um or based in a fairy tale it was based on a book but it, but this book was not necessarily a fairy tale however what was what i found was interesting is that 
um, one of the guys that helped translate it from its natural language was this guy that was a Soviet spy that then defected to the United States. And I think he got like awarded by uh, Ronald Reagan or something for, you know, being like a defector back then. But the, he was the one that actually translated Bambi into English. And he also was responsible for translating a lot of uh, Brothers Grimm into English. So like there's this Brothers Grimm connection to almost every Disney movie still up to this point, it seems, even if it's indirect. Yeah, it's going to, I guess, reading it, that's the type of, I guess, Walt Disney or, or someone in the company was just a fan of that style of writing, his particular style. So when it happens, I, you know, I think a lot of people in high school, they, they read that one Kurt Vonnegut book and then read like all of them. <laughs> At least that's what I did. <laughs> well, and, and this guy did write a couple other, um, what was his name? It was uh, Felix Salton. And he did write a couple other books that were sort of in the same vein. One of them was called 15 Rabbits. And it was about this group of rabbits that just slowly over the course of the book uh, just end up dying one by one. And again, it's about like the horrible realities of nature and how kind of cruel and unforgiving nature is. And there was, I mean, because again, it was written um, in World War One and, and up to, you know, leading into the, the conditions that led to World War Two, there were some examples that um, some of his works might have been written about kind of that that plight of the Jewish people, because I guess he was also Jewish, although he did not um, identify himself as such until after he had written a whole bunch of these works. Um, prior to that, he considered himself a humanist. I do have to throw out one story with, with rabbits. When I was a kid, uh, family friends uh, gave me a pet rabbit, right? And then the friends, I actually, they moved off to Switzerland, so not too far off from the source of this movie. But um, yeah, uh, anyway, the rabbit, my, my parents were like, oh, he, he hopped away, you know, he's gone. Of course, they were lying to me, but. <laughs> That's a um, long-term gift to give someone. That's it is. not like a goldfish, you know what I mean? Like a rabbit stays around for a while. It's like a decade, isn't it? Well, not in my case, it hopped away, well, right? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go forward a decade, they've moved back to the States and we're having dinner and they're like, whatever happened to that rabbit? My mom's like, oh, the dog next door gave it a heart attack and it died. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like 17 by this point or whatever. <laughs> yep. So uh, yeah, I guess they were like, oh, he's 17. He, he knows this already. What else, what else just, haven't they told me? <laughs> right, exactly. Don't, don't, don't tell me Santa's not real. <laughs> Says, says the 17 year old punk rocker <laughs> um let's see uh you said you had a few notes of your own you wanted to throw out on this one uh i've got it yeah i've got a number kind of like all over the place but i think some will, will be interesting um so one of them is that this one you can clearly see in the very opening shot the different planes of animation i think there's about four if you count them um, but it's it's really interesting how they do it and like the water going in the background. Um, and then the one of the first characters that you see is the owl. And the owl is like this weird, old, grumpy, uh, sort of like, you know, this old man that even there's a, there's a couple spots in the movie itself that they don't paint him as necessarily evil, but he's kind of like this crabby old guy. And one is when there's like a huge lightning flash and the shadow of the owl in particular makes this like scary looking sort of outline um and then there's a, another place where he's like telling all the birds to sh it's like right after i think right after bambi's mom dies <laughs> and all the birds are singing and they're like you know uh just don't, don't dwell on bad things and you know things will be better if you think that they're better and then the owl comes out and he's like you know keep it down shut up with all that racket and they all kind of like boo him um and he and he walks away and out of out of just kind of being like funny and and sort of like sarcastic i wrote uh oh there's an owl luminati confirmed you know that they're clearly <laughs> talking about um you know secret societies and owls but then i thought about it more and and uh the joke in that actually turned into to a little bit of seriousness because a they do make the owl look like this crabby old you know grumpy old guy that lives in this tree and I don't know, I didn't get to bring this up on the episode that I was on with Sam Tripoli, but uh, Walt Disney was in, I wouldn't call it a secret society, but he was doing a social club called the Rancheros Vistadores, which stands for the Visiting Ranchers. Have you ever heard of this before? No, it was new to me. So, so he's, he's in this 
tight little social club and essentially it was modeled after the bohemian grove and are, are you familiar with bohemian grove at all and the origins oh yeah of bohemian grove? oh yeah okay Definitely know that one <laughs> so that so the the very high you know um bird's eye view overview of bohemian grove is that a bunch of artists and sort of you know bohemians and musicians that were sick of working for you know corporate sponsorships and working for you know commercials and newspapers and stuff they would all go into the woods and sort of just like express themselves creatively and just do all kinds of creative stuff and then that sort of got infiltrated over time by the same people that were funding them and uh, they kind of took it over but um walt disney had 100 percent had to be aware of bohemian grove there's no way he didn't like because his animators and his writers and musicians had to have so much bleed over because it was right there in california and you couldn't throw a you know you couldn't throw a rock in a room full of um creatives and not hit one person that probably was in bohemian grove at that point um you know prior to the 1950s essentially so anyways in 1930 rancheros vistadoras is put together and they they essentially want to be what bohemian grove says that they are which is like this old boy scout camping group for you know for the boys but like rich old guys but as they were when they were boys but bohemian grove turned into like a like a pagan debauchery kind of thing so Walt Disney being a little bit of a prude um, and wanting to, to actually connect with that more like outdoorsy feel. Um, so he joins this group of, of the Rancheros Vistadores and, and them being sort of like opposed and saying like, we're the real outdoorsy social club and screw the Bohemian um, Grove guys. It was hard for me to not see this old cranky, you know, butt of the joke owl as not being perhaps related to, you know, him poking fun at Bohemian Grove. And I know that's a stretch, but but this, the Vistadoras uh, or the Rancheros link is just too close to to make it not a very real possibility. Okay. Yeah, my, my note on that is just Al understands that these songs don't rate with the Snow White Pinocchio <laughs> ones. <laughs> Shut up. Give me some good music. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, it always kind of blew my mind because um, at, at my office, the the lady who started the company uh just she put a bunch of owl decorations all over our office so that's always like, that's a little weird <laughs> it, it gives like a weird feeling like i'm watching you right oh uh, yeah maybe that's it uh oh and after, actually after recording a podcast because um uh, my my buddy i actually work with you know sometimes we'll record in temples and we, we did some movie or twilight zone or something i think it was a twilight zone which makes it weirder you know to, left the temple and uh suddenly there's just an owl like that looks like this like a very like you know <laughs> like like quintessential owl just like sitting there on the power line above us so i mean it's kind of cool but yeah <laughs> it was a bit shocking because you know it's just like whoa there's a full-size owl like five feet away <laughs> is this the same design they use for the poo owl winnie the poo owl I guess that's because we do get the Chippendale designs in here. They're, they're running all, they're scampering all over the place here. Yeah. Well, and I, again, like with the anthropomorphic animals, they started expanding on this style. So every, every time they did something that they saw work, you know, you could just see them reusing it in almost every other movie that comes afterwards. Anyway, uh, what, what, what do you have beyond, beyond owls? Uh, let's see here. Um, the, the thumper quote has to be the the most quotable part of the entire movie which is the whole if you can't say something nice don't say nothing at all um that just that actually stood out the to source? me of like that well this is i mean that's that's the quote that thumper says here and to me that's the most quotable line in the entire movie that if you hear anyone ever say that it pretty much comes from this bambi movie and from thumper saying at that point and it was just and also just to be like kind of a uh, a grammar nazi in a way but it's technically a double negative to don't say nothing at all so he's technically saying if you can't say something nice then go ahead and say it <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's the uh, subtle uh the subconscious message coming through so what else i got here <laughs> that um apparently oh so there was like there was a code so speaking of owls <laughs> i did a uh, I was trying to do some more research into finding out, like, did the, uh, I mean, I wasn't expecting anything to come up, but, you know, was the friend owl, which is his name, um, related to Bohemian Grove in any way? And one of the search results that came up was 
people also ask, did Walt Disney stomp an owl to death? And I had to click on this. Oh, yeah, because, you sent me that. <laughs> because first I was wondering how many people are actually asking that? Like, I've never asked myself <laughs> that question in my life. Did Walt Disney stomp an owl to death? Why, why would that even be such a popular question that was being suggested at the top of Google? But sure enough, it mentions that uh, when he was a, a young child living on an orchard farm or uh, living in Missouri, and he was nearby in an orchard farm, he crept up behind a brown owl and I guess when he he tried to like sneak up behind it, and when he did that, the owl freaked out and started like clawing at him, and he threw the owl to the ground because now he's freaking out because the owl's attacking him. He threw it to the ground. And he stomped it to death. So Walt Disney, uh, at a very young age, did in fact stomp an owl to death, um, <laughs> unprovoked. He snuck up on an owl, unprovoked, and stomped it to death. So now anytime I see an owl in any Disney animation, (laughs) I'm going to think a little bit deeper into the motivation of that owl character. Yeah, I I was just looking, and um, the the poo owl is just a slight modification from this one. Uh, Cued it up just a little bit, but basically the same design. Um, Yeah, I I, I took out a deer with a car, as as one does. Um, Athens, Georgia, it was a foggy night. Uh, driving my girlfriend's car uh, and you know, we hit it, hit it and uh, we didn't have money because we were college students so I fixed the car with duct tape like the headlight fell out <laughs> I guess I did an okay job it worked for like a, a month or two and then the car ex- engine exploded <laughs> I mean honestly I mean I, I grew up in upstate New York and it was such a common story I, I knew I mean my my family knew multiple people that had family members that died because they were just driving at night somewhere and a deer jumped out in front of them and killed them both you know just you know they drove off or it was just like a high impact because again if you're driving 60 70 miles hours in the dark and all of a sudden there's a deer right in front of you um i mean there was really nasty stories so there's there's people that grow to like just absolutely hate deer because like that deer literally it's like that deer killed my paw you know what i mean (laughs) and they're not joking like they're actually serious about it um and a lot of of friends and family that specifically hunted deer to eat you know that was their main diet for a large you know at least through hunting season um venison was like the number one protein for all the meals so there's there's a very different sort of perspective on people that grow up around plentiful amounts of deers and then maybe someone that's just like watching this movie from a city or something that's never actually seen a deer before because deers are 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 cute again this bambi effect right like they're so cute and and helpless and harmless looking but they're absolutely sort of a a nuisance species yeah yeah uh like i said it's a boy scout we go camping to georgia part of the appalachians for the most part and and, then deer everywhere so you'd have to watch out for that stuff actually it's funny uh, we don't see quite as many wild animals in japan you know i spotted my owl we also do a podcast where a fox came up that was pretty trippy but um that sounds awesome yeah uh but you you start shooting a disney movie of your own pretty soon no i was gonna say when when my wife and a couple of her friends visited america and they were my parents house and my parents have a big glass door at the back and outside is the backyard and they just saw like yours there's like a chipmunk or two and a squirrel and they just started like squealing like you know little girls watching a disney movie like ah (laughs) we're like that's that's just the backyard (laughs) yeah that's just the backyard yo and and even in japan a a, a girl i stayed in a few years earlier we did spot a squirrel near a temple in japan she was flipping out because now i understand yeah it is kind of rare to see that but it was like I hadn't been in Japan. I'm like, yeah, it's a squirrel outside. What's weird about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe I start squealing now, looking at my parents' backyard since it's, it's uh, since I haven't been in the states for so long. <laughs> so, so I do want to go uh, um, dig deep a little bit more into this um, sort of like the killing of deer and the overpopulation deer because I because I found a couple interesting notes that might be good for just fodder to to talk back and forth about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, I was looking up because first of all, they, they kill, um, di- um, Bambi's mom. And apparently even when the movie came out, a bunch of hunters immediately started, uh, I wouldn't say protest, but you know, they were like writing 
to Disney and like writing into the paper, like, oh, you know, I've got these opinions that are really strong. But one of them was that the hunters do not kill um, the doe at this point of time in the year. It was like, it was kind of like against hunter etiquette, but it was also, I think, might have been against the law at the time, uh, even in the 40s when the, the movie came out, that you wouldn't necessarily kill it until the the doe or the the fawn had completely weaned from the doe so i just i was interested in like well how long is that and it's about two and a half months so it is a little bit morbid to just consider like you know uh, murdering a two and a half month year old's mother um and they're very real like the scene where bambi's like running away and you hear the mother get shot in the background and it's like calling for the mom like that legitimately seems like something that happens very often in just like the normal day-to-day of kind of culling and hunting of of this uh, of deer and again like i was mentioning and there was a report from michigan state university 2020 and they essentially mentioned that that there's a decline of people that want to hunt because there's like a, a growing sentiment of um, animal sentience and you know vegetarianism and just the people that do the classical hunting are just fewer and fewer that they've ever been ever before in history. Um, so you you match that with the fact that again deer have no natural predators outside of coyotes and humans, but with humans backing off a little bit, it's not like coyotes are just automatically coming in and filling that space. So deer are just like exploding in populations in ways that are uncontrollable. And in, uh, in 2020, uh, it, the estimates were somewhere around over 200,000 deer were hunted uh, in that one hunting season alone, um, just to give a kind of like a, a spec. And that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough to actually keep the population in check, which is interesting. And I was just trying to think of this to its most logical conclusion of like, Let's say that like no one wants to hunt deer anymore. Let's just say that everyone watches Bambi and says, you know, that's horrible. I'm never going to eat meat again. And we just, everyone just goes on a full vegan vegetarian diet, right? Well, now all of a sudden deer um, are, are not being hunted by their number one predator, which is humans. So their, their population continues to explode. But then there becomes a point where so many humans are now relying on vegetables and, you know, say corn and fields of corn. But now the deer become like the enemy in, in the fact that they come and eat all the corn. And now if there's not enough corn to feed people, deer would very realistically be starving people to death because they're eating the corn meant for the people because the people are no longer eating the deer. You know what I mean? Like it's this weird um sort of like where does it end um mentality and then i was also thinking of well let's just say that you build fences up around so that the deer can't get to any of the corn anywhere well then you're just gonna sit here and watch just like massive number like literally you know five hundred thousand deer half a million deer just starve to death slowly so like where like where is the the humanitarian aspect of this because it's not just like let nature handle it right I guess I'll have two responses. One one is I actually did kind of pick up that it didn't seem like the right time to be killing the deer, not because I know anything about hunting, but it didn't feel like the rabbit season, duck season, Warner Brother uh, cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> right. They didn't have a big a big uh, post, a uh, notice posted. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, no notices. Um, uh, the the other one is while you were talking about the the deer eating eating the corn and like kind of taking over, I just had this replay of 1968's Planet of the Apes, but with like you know deer in the place of the apes. <laughs> you, know, you damn dirty deer! <laughs> but it's even harder because like the the deers are so cute, right? And they look so helpless and harmless. They're just they're just eating leaves, you know. They're not like attacking you and and throwing you in jail. They can't. They don't even have opposable thumbs. Um, but it, but like again, considering that whole like uh, the Disney or the Bambi effect, where people all of a sudden want to protect and prevent people from hunting deer just because of how cute the damn cartoon was, um, it just it was it's an interesting topic. I don't know, it's a very interesting topic to me that 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 without humans, deer would literally be just like running things in in the North uh, United States essentially, <laughs> and yeah. that that there's like they very necessarily have to be murdered essentially i mean all of the research and all of the the university reports and everything seems the point that like we absolutely need to be murdering at least quarter of a million deer on average per hunting season otherwise it gets out of control at the so same time so there's, though, 
this movie does lay out the you know things have to die things have to change i mean you know they make the hunter look horrible but the, everything else is well just multiply cycles. that times quarter million right there's there's a quarter of a million bambies played out every single year one other thing just watching this movie is at the end you're like oh bambi's badass how can any anything being bambi be badass as he's fighting the other elk <laughs> and stuff you know i just i do find it fun how oh you now bambi is now a, a well man, they should have at least called him man. like 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 the big bambino or something right yeah 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 and the adult version could have had like a brooklyn accent that would have been awesome <laughs> yo bambi's here yeah I, would, I could dig that um what is this has been like kind of a running theme and podcast that I do recently. What what is the largest animal that you would take barehanded in a in a steel cage? Uh, probably a field mouse. Okay, <laughs> that, that that was asked at the company dinner. Actually, and someone was like an ant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to I want to revise my answer to an ant if that counts as an though. animal. Yeah, maybe squish it or something. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just fun when people are like, hmm, "Can I take a panda in a cage?" I don't know. <laughs> A lesser panda. I could take on a lesser panda, maybe. I don't know. That, that I feel like I just answer. don't have anything to prove. <laughs> like, yeah. like if I if I truly need to exert myself over nature, I've got you know ten thousand years of history that shows that I can basically take care of any sort of natural thing as long as I can plan for it. Um, I want to bop down your your notes while you still have a a bit of time here. So, so I had a, a couple of um um quotes from the original book that that was left out from the movie and i think it 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 makes a really good point i've got two ones that i can read here so first in the in the course of just two pages in the original book of bambi in the woods a fox tears apart a pheasant a ferret fa uh, fatally wounds a squirrel in a fight a flock of crows uh attacks one of the rabbits um, and uh, one of, you know, one of uh, Thumper's friends, essentially, and they leave him to die in excruciating pain. And this is just in, within two pages of the book. Mm -hmm. And then also towards the end of the book, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, Bambi, Bambi essentially batters the deer that he fights with, uh, or the other buck, he battles him to uh, almost death where the other buck is begging for mercy while Bambi's cousin girlfriend is laughing about it. Like, she's like, oh, this is so funny. You guys are fighting over me. Um, and then um, the, the author, Sultan, he insisted that the reason why he put all of these scenes in here that I just mentioned was to educate what he called naive readers about nature as it really is, a place that where life is always contingent on death and where starvation, competition, and predation are the norm. And you don't get any of that from the movie whatsoever. All you get from the movie is uh, cute animals, good, um, evil man with gun, bad. And that's essentially as, as deep as it gets. And, you know, and man with fire, bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that starts from a campsite, doesn't it? Because I am thinking, you know, you they could have still had nature be quite an adversary just by having, you know, like the fire be a natural one or something like that. I, I guess they, you know, we're trying to walk a certain line here. So, and then, and I got two other notes here. One is that it seems to me that Bambi's mom had no role in the movie other than to die. Like there was, she didn't, she like, she passed off all of the, you know, teaching of how to be a deer to just Bambi to learn on his own from, essentially the rabbits and then watching the other bucks out in the field but the mom was just there to die and you know to to get a little bit of um sort of like favor from the audience and then to murder that favor just to pull on the heartstrings I, it, it that's what it came across as and then the other note it. that i had here was that uh um i don't know if this is the first version but when i looked up the word this word is credited to being born from the bambi movie 1942 but Twitter pated. And this is when the, the owl comes out of the tree. Um, I think after Bambi's mom dies and he starts talking about Twitter pated. And I think he's talking about animals in heat um, that are starting to like mate, like, you know, Bambi has now reached puberty and all of a sudden he's like infatuated with this other, his cousin essentially, right. <laughs> he's falling in love with his cousin. Let's not forget that. And the owl mentions this has Twitter pated. And I don't know. I just, I made a note that that sounded interesting. I'd never heard that, that word used before. Um, and obviously the word Twitter in front of that sound like bird related, but I wonder, you know, where, 
if if that word truly was just originated in this movie or just popularized by it i'm not even sure yet well i at least half of it right but it's like you know george orwell gave us what 20 words we use regularly now <laughs> and, and i've heard too that john d <laughs> the uh the mysticist that worked under uh queen elizabeth 007. also was like was yeah the, the original 007 um that he is credited with like the most number of english words that are still used today in dictionaries which is insane to me <laughs> i i now that i you know teach english in japan and stuff i don't do it but i for a while my father definitely has the um the habit of just making up words on the spot and i used to do that but you know when you're teaching <laughs> english as a second language I, that gets a little too confusing <laughs> well with with uh with the actual twitterverse uh, now i mean even a word that you accidentally make up like people are using it unironically multiple times somewhere out the, there on the internet so eventually it just becomes a word from people using it enough well, I, I hate that, you know, the word meta is now becoming something completely different because that, that was a fun word to use five years ago in a different context. <laughs> oh, well, now you get sued if you even say it out loud without paying money to uh, the meta corporation, right? Oh, crap. We said we owe them 50 <laughs> <Okay>. million now. <laughs> Add another um, one to the piggy bank. What was it? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure where the word uh, hipster sits now. Is it, is it okay to be a hipster again? 10 years ago it wasn't it might it might be cool i don't know okay i don't know i won't i won't be uh i'm not gonna blaze that trail but <laughs> i'll be behind you if you want to start it okay and I, i'm behind Br uh, bringing hipsters back i'm behind seinfeld elaine's hipster doofus <laughs> for me that's where it's at um did you have any other notes you wanted to, to call call your notes uh, I guess I guess the only other one was to um, to elaborate a little bit more when I said before that in the book, Bambi has another friend called Gobo or Gabo, G-O-B-O. -O, and when the hunter fires the gun and kills Bambi, you know, all the other animals scatter. Well, I guess when they all scatter, Gobo runs towards the humans elsewhere and they end up like adopting it as a pet and feeding it and, you know, being like really nice to it. Um, so in the book, he comes back and he tells them that you all think he's wicked. And in the book, whenever they say he or him, it's have as a capital H because essentially the, the deer look at humankind as like God, uh, the same way that if you were writing the Bible and talk about he and him with the capital H, you're talking about, you know, like a God to us. So the original book was written as if the deer looked at human as gods, but then at the very end, um, Gobo ends up getting shot by a different group of hunters um, to kind of prove that, you know, in fact, the deer shouldn't get so used to being with humans that it trusts them all the time because they also die. Um, but then at the very end of the book, uh, Bambi comes across a dead human that was shot by another human. And this kind of opens up this like almost like a meta uh, sort of storyline where they realize, oh, you know, um, he is not God. You know, humans aren't God because they killed each other. So there actually must be something even higher than them, which is such a deep and profound ending that you know, it's almost like a shame that that part got left out, but I can understand why in the 1942 Disney movie, they didn't want to show two hunters shooting each other um, and dying. But I thought that was such an interesting part of the book that unfortunately isn't known. And then let's face it, we already did have in Pinocchio the creation asking its uh, creator, you know, lots of questions <laughs> and, and basically learning that his creator doesn't have all the answers <laughs> yeah, this this one just felt the whole movie bambi felt a little bit of a a backward step like there's not a lot here for an adult to sit down and be like oh my kid's being entertained but this is also kind of like some deep stuff that it's bringing up bambi kind of lacked all of that and it just really feels like a movie that you would put on to just babysit kids or you can just walk away which ironically you know um as long as they don't hear the gunshot, you don't even know that anything violent happens in the entire movie. And I feel like, I don't know if the, the 2022, you're going to be able to keep your kids attention with it, to be honest. Cause uh, like when my daughter was a toddler, yeah, with Snow White went on a lot. Uh, Pinocchio went on a lot. Dumbo went on a lot. And Bambi maybe played once or twice. 
you know, it just it, it didn't catch her attention as a kid. So some, I, I guess this movie is interesting as a, a as a workshop, you know, like in music, it's like that weird follow up to the massive hit album where they just try it, you know, like Fleetwood Mac's Tusk or something where there's some real interesting stuff there, but it just goes all over the place. And yeah, they got like unlimited us. budget and they hire like all the best of everything and then it comes together and it's just like, oh, yeah, OK, it's that it wasn't that great, was it? <laughs> So I, I guess it's the the special sauce, but uh, yeah. Or again, it, if this is the worst feature film that Disney had to offer in its you know first twenty year run or so, that's doing pretty good for itself, I think. Yeah, and again, commercial success by any definition that you can come up with, it it absolutely blew everything else out of the water. So, um, in terms of getting people into seats and selling tickets, and you know the fact that we're still talking about it now, how many countless movies? Um, haven't even been watched you know what I mean or talked about um, compared to Bambi I mean there's probably uh, like no offense to this the podcast around but I guarantee you there's at least one other podcast out there in the world right now that's also talking about Bambi that's how popular this movie is right right the the chance of that happening is is non-zero I was just sitting here thinking because now Disney kind of runs that with say you know Pirates of the Caribbean sequels or whatever and i i checked out after the third one on that series but uh <laughs> i'm like in 50 years or more 70 years are people going to be talking about the pirates series i mean probably i just yeah that's gonna be a weird conversation <laughs> maybe i don't know that's a good question i don't know yeah. if, i don't know I'm, if they really will because it's yeah, more of a sure. it's more of a johnny depp spectacle product of its time way more than i mean i without question people are going to be talking about bambi in 100 years like i would put you know i would put plenty of money because it's it's like a thing that's going to come up in every animation school um you know 101 from now until the end of time essentially like bambi's going to always come up pirates of the caribbean it might come up in like a footnote of weird like american pop culture like trivia or something but i don't know if it has that like test of time quality to it yeah i don't think people are going to be talking about the way people not they might talk about how the legs move in that movie because of johnny depp's weird walk but yeah <laughs> <laughs> or not i don't know but yeah i mean it, it's all yeah this this does i guess as a workshop it's fascinating so it at least has that going for it um i guess we will wrap it up for today then so uh tell people where you're at Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I do things. Uh, paranoidamerican.com, um, comic books and coloring books and working on a couple of games for maybe later this year, early next year. Um, and I worked at Disney for about 10 years in the uh, post-production building at Hollywood Studios here in Orlando. So uh, if you're wondering why we're, you know, two grown men are still talking about Disney, that's, uh, that's at least my excuse. I don't know what Matt's excuse is. <laughs> I, I got a DVD folder right here. That's that's my excuse. Okay. okay. <laughs> my, I think I've shown it to you before. There, I got this. Is it the the pink the pink DVD folder filled with Disney movies? How pretty is that seem? But yeah, you know, my daughter didn't want it anymore. Right? It's not hers anymore. So now it's mine. <laughs> I can't I take. Yeah, would, so, so I'm curious. Would Bambi make your top ten, uh, or would it would it make any of your lists, or would it make like your bottom ten list? Um. It'd probably be right smack in the middle because there's, okay. def- there's definitely Matt. some films that are i think that's how i started this podcast right <laughs> yeah there, there yeah. are definitely some disney movies that are aggressively bad <laughs> that right are, right that are hard to even finish i mean ban- for for what it's worth aside from all the criticisms it's not hard to get through bambi it might be a little bit boring um in the middle but again the animation is so on point and sometimes just watching how much work went into animating the movements of the animals and stuff. It's like, I don't care that they're annoying and they're just talk. They're just like, we're, you know, saying the word bird over and over, like teaching a baby how to talk. That's fine. If you want to do that for 10 minutes, uh, as long as the animation is really, really good, uh, it goes by and it's not, it's not painful to watch. There are absolutely some, some painful Disney movies that are probably coming up. Br- 70, bring them on <laughs> it's a 70 minute movie this podcast is now longer than the movie yeah so. <laughs> oh i remember the last question i wanted to ask uh, since since we know a man with a, a pet alligator now would you take on the pet alligator uh i don't know i mean no i mean by choice no although <laughs> although if there's like a law if if alligator was the thing you put me up against so specific specifically the size of one's alligator 
Um, there's way worse things that you could put me up against, especially since you can just turn an alligator on its back and it'll fall asleep. Or if you can just get, if you can just get something around its mouth so that it can't open its mouth. There's not a lot else that it can do to you. Um, now, if you approach it in the water, then you're absolutely screwed. And there's almost nothing that you can do if you're like, you know, get caught off guard on like a riverbank or something. But if you're just like, you know, if you put me in like a pin with another alligator, both on the ground, and there's no water anywhere. Um, I give myself at least a 30% chance, uh -oh, which is good, which is very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I might have mentioned before I taught environmental education and um, basically the swamps of South Carolina. And, it, and I take kids around on hikes and stuff. And it wasn't the alligators I was worrying about so much because they were just usually chilling, you know, a few meters off the side of the trail. It was, just, it was the snakes, right? <laughs> Because there's lots of highly poisonous snakes just coming out of nowhere. Yeah, which is you why... got like coral snakes and water moccasins and yep. all kinds. And that's why I don't like snakes anymore. Because <laughs> I remember, actually, same family friends gave me a rabbit. Their son had like a boa constrictor. And I, I know it might have been the same evening. I had the boa constrictor like all on my arm. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Five years later, after doing the uh, environmental education job, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so many people lose appendages and lives uh to that right yeah um i guess i should do a bit of my spiel that this is the oral hygiene slash across disney podcast I, I might be putting it on its own feed but the, my, the only reason i haven't done it so far is like well what should i but i keep saying oral hygiene is that my name now anyway oral hygiene pod at twitter and facebook we're in the podcasting umbrella of on patreon of podcastio podcastius where i also talk about sci-fi movies the twilight zone at time enough podcast and for those gamers out there you can find podcasts on pokemon monster hunter and four british guys screaming at each other about game show trivia and the game <laughs> game show <laughs> okay as always it's been jolly so i'll catch you after the war then because that's that's where we go i guess <laughs>